Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the session entitled Recharging Growth in China. My name is Tian Wei. I'm a moderator and host coming from uh, CGTN from China. Such a pleasure to see all of you here. Everybody's fighting the morning traffic to be here for this early session. So really appreciate your presence here today. Having said that though, this is one of the most important topics, I think here in this town and also in the world. The state of China's economy and its future potential with all your contributions. We have heard from the Chinese premier about the, his understanding of the Chinese economy and the messages coming from the Chinese government in terms of policy and in terms of building a future together. That is on the policy side. Meanwhile, lately, we heard about the 5.2 growth of the GDP in China. Well, at the same time, we understand there is a transformation going on in the Chinese economy. But how fast it is happening, what is really going to be China's relationship with the rest of the world in terms of where its economy is going, what are the roles different stakeholders can play, will play, and would like to play. So we are going to ask all these questions in our discussion. With a strong panel sitting on the stage, the best thing for a moderator is to be as short as possible in her sentences. I'm going to do exactly that from now on. So my great honor to introduce our panelists one by one. Uh, the sitting order is not necessarily with, about authority. It's really just about the names and mixture of uh, people from different parts of the world. Okay, so let's have uh, Ambassador Kevin Rudd, Ambassador Australia to the United States. We call him Lao Lu in China. Good to see you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a long time. Uh, in, in. Late, later, you translate for yourself. Could you do that? <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then we have, uh, with honor, uh, Valen Garrido, Chair of the Executive Board and Chief Executive Officer of Merck, uh, based in Germany. She's also a member of the International Business Council of WEF. Good to see you, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you. Sitting over there, Mr. Jia Shaoqian, Chairman of Hisense Group from China. Good to see you, Mr. Jia. And there we have Jing Ke Yu, Professor of Economics from the London School of Economics and Political Science based in the UK. Good to see you, Ms. Jin. Last but certainly not least, a uh, uh, longtime friend of, of, the least. <laughs> of the forum and always a very moderate person, um, uh, Mr. Zhu Min, Vice Chairman of the China Center for International Economic Exchanges, CCIEE, from China. He's also a member of the Board of Trustees of WEF. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. All right, so let's jump directly into the discussion. Why not the challenges first, so that everybody feel the questions in their mind can be addressed? Um, Mr. Zhu. Oh, wow. <laughs> Real oh. estate problem, China. local government debt, and the list goes on, seems to be what's in the media. What exactly? is the state of China's economy to you? Well, I think the growth is 5.2%. It's not too bad. It showed the resilience of China's economy. But if you go down to the details, you will say the consumption actually increased 6.1%. Uh, it's quite strong. Actually, the, the capital investments is only 5%, not as strong as we expected. But it is good because we want to mark a consumption pick up. Exports is weak. You know, only almost zero growth for last year, which, which was the main growth engine for China. Um, so if you see the whole thing, you, you can see the structure change in the way, but support overall the growth. Um, I think that's the picture I'm reading for Chinese economy today. But when you mention the, the, the challenges, I think basically Chinese economy facing two challenges. One is the cyclical challenges, because after 30 years of strong growth, the growth is slowing down. Obviously, all right, you have uh, aging populations, you have uh, lower productivities, and you have the structure change, all those things. So you would not expect China have a 
super strong 10% of growth, right? I mean, you cannot do that. So you have to take it. Growth is slowing down. I think quite a few years ago, I did a study on the potential of Chinese economic growth. We estimate that time, Chinese growth will be stabilized in this time, around 4.5%. So if we can do that, it's pretty good. I think it's the, the trend issue. But more on the structure issue. The Chinese economy previously is more driven by three key drives. One is infrastructure investments, which always account more than 50% of GDP. Mm -hmm. The second is real estate, and really grow strongly. And the third is export. Now those three things are all gone because the return on infrastructure structure is so low is number one. The last year, the real estate investments was a negative 9.1 percent. The, the real the sales is a 1.1 billion square meter. It's a huge number, 1.1 billion square meter, but still drop 8.1 percent compared with even a year ago. So the real estate is a still a big economy, but not the growth engine. It's gone in terms of growth. The exports used to be very strong. 2022, China have a 3 percentage of GDP growth, 2 percentage point from net exports. But last is a zero. So all those gone. So what's that new? We have to find a new growth engine. So new growth engine basically come from domestic consumption, digitalized manufacturing, and the carbon neutrality transformation. Mm -hmm. I think this reason will support China's growth in medium and even long term. Let me uh, take, say, one minutes to explain. Yep. Um, the first issue is domestic consumption last year was picked up, 7% of growth, it's not too bad. You know, it takes time because you need to increase the social security expenditures from fiscal policies, you need to boost the people's salaries, you make sure people have a confidence to consume, so it takes time. It's, so 7% growth on consumption is a really good number. And the digitalization for the manufacturing is important. China's manufacturer account of 30 0.3% of a total global manufacturing, equivalent to US plus Japan plus Germany per South Korea. Mm. So after years, we realized that's the real strength of the Chinese economy. To deal with decoupling the strategies, we want to make sure the manufacturing become ever stronger. So before you leave, you have to come okay. with us because it's so good. So digitalization move very fast. If you're looking for uh, the investments in a uh, loss uh, in the, the, the manufacturing is 8%, it's very strong. And the uh, high tech is 12.6% of growth. Carbon neutrality is uh, another big area. We're going to talk about some of these news uh, a bit later, if I could. Uh, I see you are trying to provide a great answer about whether it's cyclical or it's structural. On that, I also want to go to Professor Jin, your thoughts briefly. Well, first of all, booms and busts is a natural feature of market economies. In the last 40 years, China has really never had a bust. So bust cycles also oust less productive firms and provides exit me mechanisms. And that creative destruction, I think, is one of the bright spots of, of, um, of, the, of the situation. Look, you know, China is suffering from a severe deficit in demand mm -hmm. because of low wage growth, scarring effects of the pandemic, and of course, the real estate. Um, but I just want to say, because of China's size today, growing at 3 to 4% even is not a bad thing. If India grows 4 percentage points faster than China from now until 2030, China is still going to contribute $130 trillion of additional GDP more than India will uh, to the world. Now, briefly, um, I totally agree with um, uh, uh, Mr. Zhu's uh, assessment of uh, transitioning to a productivity, innovation-driven economy. That's the only way that's going to sustain growth in the long run, so that's a good thing. But guess what? You know, renewables or digitization, in the short term, it can't possibly displace real estate as a provider for growth and employment in the way that it had in the last 10 years uh, or so. Second, services. Right now, it only accounts for half of GDP and only 48% of employment. That number is 80% in advanced economies. So you can imagine a whole amount of room uh, for also absorb, absorbing the youth uh, who are underemployed, highly educated. They account for more uh, educated skill force than manufacturing. And you also have almost a billion people who haven't really reached the middle income by international standards, living under $300 uh, per month. So I can go on and on. When even Japan and Korea leveled off their growth, their productivity as a share of GDP, as, as a share of the U.S. was already 80 percent, and China is still very low. So a lot of room for convergence. Mm -hmm. So I think we want to separate the cyclical problems of demand from some of the longer-term challenges.
I'm so happy we already got the uh, economist uh, geared up at the very beginning of the conversation. Well, let's go somewhere. Uh, then uh, we want to ask, what about the businesses? How are they feeling the temperatures? The, uh, given the big, big backdrop of uh, the economy that the two economists uh, just uh, painted, uh, about international, global companies, I think uh, uh, Ms. Garejo is a great representative based in Germany, but has been doing business with China for decades. So tell me how you are feeling the body temperature of China's economy. So indeed, we have been in China for 90 years, and, and of course, China is an important uh, opportunity for, uh, uh, to ensure uh, sustainable, high quality development for future years. Mm. Um, I think the, the, the challenge um, uh, in the economy today, which at the end, you know, as, as other speakers said, seems to be a bit better than expected. Uh, the challenge that we see in China at this time is to, to really balance national security issues, uh, resilience and growth. At the end of the day, China is an export country like Germany is, and for that um, we need reliable uh, rules. Uh, we need global, uh, healthy, and uh, fair uh, competition, right? So in a, in a nutshell, we need a, a, a level playing field for international businesses so that we can continue uh, to contribute to economic growth in China through our international investments. Mm. Uh, we heard uh, from the speech uh, given by Chinese Premier, he talked about the size of the Chinese econ economy, uh, the market, still attractive. And meanwhile, talking about the continuous consultation with the global companies, if I remember right, about uh, government procurement and also uh, the flow of data, uh, just to say a few examples. How do you see these kinds of uh, uh, policy attitudes vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, your concerns and also your plans for the future of your company in China? Look, we continue to, uh, to uh, operate under a, a China for China strategy. That means we are extremely well placed to, to serve the needs of our customers and, 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 and to serve the patients uh, in China through our life science, healthcare, and electronics uh, business uh, sectors. So, um, look, just to take an example um, um, of the biopharma business, mm. uh, which is also having a very positive impact on the prospects that we see for, for our life science business, uh, China today is uh, uh, managing 22% of the global R&D, following the US with uh, 27%, uh, and followed by Japan with only 7%. So the, the, the uh, booming of uh, biotech and research in China, the booming of new technologies is, is for, a, for a company like ours uh, a tremendously attractive opportunity. Uh, we operate, uh, as I mentioned, with, uh, with a uh, significant presence. We have 5,000 employees in China. We have several uh, factories, innovation hubs. But we, uh, we uh, rely also on trust-based partnerships with uh, local companies to be able to, uh, to, uh, to accelerate our contributions to customers and patients, mm -hmm. and, and most importantly, to, to continue to contribute to our global growth and resilience. You mentioned the word uh, trust. Uh, that is a very tempting word. We're going to let everybody talk about that uh, a bit later, I guess, also related to the economy. Let me now go to the Chinese entrepreneur, uh, Mr. Jia, sitting here. Jia Zong, uh, uh, So as we know, Hisense, uh, where you come from, is a, a Chinese manufacturer, one of the uh, largest uh, in the country of its kind. So how do you feel the temperature of the Chinese economy where you are. Uh, you just share a few words with us about how you see the temperature of the Chinese economy in your sector. Well, 2023 was a very difficult year, not just for us, but also for our counterparts outside China. 
Now, maintaining 5.2% economic growth was a real positive surprise for us. And uh, the uh, government has made a lot of efforts in different, uh, very, uh, different areas to support uh, companies. Uh, so as the companies can have hi high uh, quality development. And uh, Hisense had a, a growth rate of 10% uh, last year, and uh, the profits uh, was 11%. So we can see it has done better than the uh, national average. And uh, also, we have had a growth uh, at the global level as well as at the uh, local level. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, growth has reached double-digit uh, figures. So right now, what we need, the uh, companies, what we, uh, what we need uh, is uh, an open uh, market. And uh, also, it has to be, um, of course, a market-led and market-based uh, economy. Uh, so as uh, al also, we need uh, stable industrial and supply uh, chains. So uh, you talked about double-digit figures. Company, but what you said about the double-digit, I'm kind of impressed. So how it happened? Can you share some secrets? <laughs> well, I have to keep some confidentiality. These are uh, commercial secrets, of course. but. Uh, I think it's really important uh, to have uh, innovation and uh, provide uh, high quality products as well as good experience for consumers and clients. And uh, we also uh, need to provide innovative uh, products and services to consumers in China and all over the world. And uh, I think these are all uh, important uh, things. For companies. That's what you're saying. Very interesting. We see some uh, uh, key words uh, coming from two uh, business uh, leaders over there. Uh, but you know, when you look at the logic behind these keywords, actually they're somewhat related. So if I could just throw another question to both of you before I go to uh, Ambassador Rudd, is um, we see an interesting phenomenon. On the one hand, global companies are operating, working, uh, establishing your business in China for the Chinese market in competition with the Chinese companies, but also at the same time in cooperation with the Chinese companies. And at the same time, for the overseas market, you're also competing and working together with your Chinese uh, counterparts if you look at the supply chain and many other factors. So how does that fascinating, sophisticated relationship work? And how is it happening right now within this current atmosphere of the Chinese economy. Would you like to share some of your thoughts briefly, if you can? Absolutely. I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'm just trying to pick a conversation here. Please. I think, I think this is perfectly compatible. Look, you know, I mean, we, we uh, uh, as a company, as a science and technology company who is, which is operating globally, we consider a very significant element of our resilience and, and future growth, uh, global diversification. And, 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 and in that context, we of course rely on our, on our own internal portfolio, which we develop in China. I mentioned that already in, in uh, uh, biopharma, delivering essential medicines, uh, um, in life science, in which we serve biotech and pharma customers, which is a, a very promising uh, uh, growth uh, avenue, mm. and, and also in electronics for many years, uh, um, working on display, liquid, liquid crystals, displays, and now also on semiconductors materials. So uh, relying on our organic resources and allocating capital and investing capital in China is, is definitely uh, very complementary with uh, with uh, uh, partnering with uh, uh, with high um, uh, highly prestigious pharma company uh, pharma and biotech companies in China mm. to 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 increase our impact in the local and international markets because we are also relying on on some of these uh, um, emerging innovation and, and 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 expanding biotech in China 
to uh, support companies to commercialize products outside of China, new products outside of China, which is which is a win-win for both parties, right? So we have announced several deals in the last few months uh, in which we have been licensed uh, new uh, uh, modalities for treatment of cancer mm -hmm. or, or other chronic diseases from China partners. So I think this is very, very complementary. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we do it in a very, uh, and it increases not only the local impact, in the in the in the market, but also uh, our global growth opportunity overall. You are saying this not because you know that there, there are a lot of Chinese audience watching this session, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying this because it's part, it's really part, it's, it's part of our strategy. As I said, uh, as a long-term partner uh, and and uh, as a long-term. Uh, player in, in the Chinese market, we we really value this. I insist, transparent, trust-based collaboration to increase the quality <coughs> of our service I see. to the to the customers uh, locally and globally, and most importantly, to uh, ensure uh, high quality, sustainable development of our business. All right, China. Mr. Jia, is that music to your ears? <laughs> Well, Hisense is a manufacturing uh, company, and it's also a traditional uh, home appliances company. And uh, through our development, we have uh, realized that competition, of course, is a core uh, character, uh, uh, characteristic of the market. And uh, of course, you all know that in 1992, uh, China started the uh, reform and opening up. And uh, then uh, China also became member of WTO. And uh, over the last uh, four decades, uh, China has uh, gone through a lot of changes. And also, uh, we have learned uh, to uh, face, accept uh, challenges. And uh, by accepting these challenges, we have also learned uh, from other companies, from uh, foreign uh, companies and uh, we have also uh, learned uh, how the uh, market economy, the world mar market economy, uh, works. And uh, I think uh, this has been uh, very helpful for us. And apart from competition, of course, uh, co cooperation is the other uh, main characteristic of the market economy. Uh, for example, Hisense has started cooperation with uh, Japanese companies many years ago. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, for air conditioning, we worked with Hitachi uh, many years ago. Uh, so cooperation will be be the main theme of the future market uh, development. Our fellow panelists, uh, I cannot let you escape uh, important questions such as geopolitics. Uh, we know that you have been observing China from near and afar for decades. Uh, one of the uncertainties we all know for this uh, interesting year, 2024, is geopolitics and how it's related to both the internal political agendas of different countries and their interactions. Here I would say about China and the US as well. <coughs> so of course your home country, Australia, being an important uh, player in the Asia Pacific region. So tell me more about when you are looking at our topic today, the state of Chinese economy, recharging growth, uh, how are you looking at it from where you are, Mr. Ambassador? Good. The, um, yeah, I first went to work in China probably 40 years ago this year, so I've seen a few things. Um, and the comments earlier about boom and bust and about structural and cyclical factors uh, I have observed and analyzed over four decades. We are, however, I think in quite unique circumstances today. And in large part, that's because of the overhang of let's call it geopolitics and the real world of the economy. <coughs> Second point I'd make is um, uh, when I um, see, uh, and these are my personal views, I'm, not represent I'm a China analyst, I'm not representing a government here. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's my day job. I'm here at uh, uh, Davos having a conversation uh, as best I can analyze the questions that we are confronting. Yeah. But I've never really accepted the thesis that you see written in various parts of the world about peak China. 
uh, that somehow the uh, Chinese economy is peaking, uh, slowing, and then heading towards something worse. <coughs> and the reason I analyze it in those terms is because you don't have to have been to China hundreds of times over, the, over 40 years to conclude that the Chinese consumer is the best guarantor of China's economic future. So long as the Chinese consumer has confidence in the future, uh, then the economy will continue to grow reasonably well. That's a core fact. And remember, the scale of the Chinese consumer market is uh, unprecedented in global economic history. But the Chinese consumer, uh, while I don't accept uh, peak China at all, I think it's intellectually and analytically flawed because of uh, the untapped potential of Chinese consumer demand. The Chinese consumers had a rough time in recent years. They, like the rest of us, had to endure the pandemic. Uh, since then, um, you've seen the property market, which represents 28% of GDP, go through unprecedented tumult. And if you've had your savings tied up in property investment, then frankly, you're in negative uh, investment territory. If you're in the equity market trying to make some money, putting your savings aside and then earning some more cash, guess what? China's equity markets have performed poorly as well. So the poor old Chinese consumer, frankly, in my judgment, thinking about the future, these factors together with youth unemployment, uh, which continues to be problematic, is feeling a bit battered. And so the key question for the future is the restoration of Chinese domestic consumer confidence because that is China's best long-term guarantee and lies at the heart of Chinese economic policy in the dual circulation economy model. Last point, business confidence. Uh, when we've had uh, at this conference before Vice Premier Liu He uh, tell us and tell the Chinese domestic audience about the central importance of the Chinese private sector. 60% of GDP, 90% of innovation, 60% uh, plus of Chinese taxation, 70% uh, of uh, new employment uh, creation. The future confidence of the private sector in China is of fundamental importance, like that of Chinese consumers. And Chinese uh, business confidence has taken a battering in recent years as well. So the real question for Chinese policymakers is how do you actually deal with these two confidence equations? Concluding point, trade, which uh, Jumin uh, referred to before, and traditionally a huge driver of Chinese economic growth for at least the last 30 years, if not longer. This is where geopolitics enters into the scene fundamentally. And that is, is it fundamentally disrupting all of our growth models for the future? By which I mean, are we on the cusp of seeing the emergence of a completely bifurcated global economy? That is competing supply chains across the board, not just at the high end, of technology and semiconductors. You've seen the semiconductor war between China and the United States. But through other technology categories, through to general manufacturing, which became a red hot concern in the West uh, during the pandemic when everyone became concerned that having consigned all of their manufacturing to the Chinese growth factory of the future, mm -hmm. that, that they couldn't get access to what they needed at a time of crisis. And then thirdly, on basic things such as critical minerals. Is this turning into a bifurcated global order as well? And that's where geopolitics has this potential to pull the floor from underneath our historical growth models. So in answer to your question, what are the challenges? That would be my set. Consumers, business confidence, geopolitics and trade bifurcation. Mm. I want to borrow uh, the uh, lately the policies of the World Economic Forum policy, I have a quote over there, uh, saying once you outline the challenges, you have to provide the solutions. So I'm gonna come back to you for the solutions. Uh, but what you said is one word about confidence. Whether it's consumer confidence, business confidence, or confidence about the latest trends of the global order uh, or global interaction. About that, uh, I want to have our economists to respond from their perspective and then later go to uh, the business uh, uh, representative here as well uh, to voice their opinions. Uh, Professor Jin, first, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Look, 
confidence has to come from somewhere, right? There are underlying factors that alter confidence and consumption. And of course, um, we've seen the scarring effects of the pandemic. Don't forget that Chinese households did not get the support that European American households got during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, wage growth could be declining. And we don't really know for sure, but it's not climbing. So without that, you can't possibly get consumption to be really quite uh, enthusiastic. Of course, there's real estate and the stock market. Again, <laughs> retail uh, investors account for the majority of the turnover for Chinese A shares. And so that has also been performing uh, 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 problematically. And of course, youth unemployment um, is, uh, is a challenge. But is it coming from a cyclical a feature, which is a demand deficit, in which case policies could potentially work, but you know, as we'll hear from Mr. Zhu, there are also constraints, right? There's a debt overhang on local governments. Local governments were the key implementers of economic drivers of growth, but now they are suffering from mountainous uh, uh, debt burdens. So these are some of the, the kind of uh, short-term challenges. Coming back to the trade challenges, look, you know, we're seeing in the data that trade is simply being rerouted. It's being rerouted from countries like Vietnam and Mexico. But guess who the ultimate demand and suppliers of that trade is? It's still the US and China. <clears throat> it's going from a longer, taking a longer route, and that's going to increase trade cost. And uh, Chinese, uh, some Chinese companies, from what I learned, have also set up factories in Mexico and, of course, in Vietnam to kind of circumvent some of these mm -hmm. uh, regulatory, um, some, circumvent some of these um, trade barriers. But it still has to come ultimately from countries like the US and China. Mm. About the business side, uh, Mr. Jia, if I could, uh, your company, I was looking at the reference a little bit uh, before we start this conversation, is actually what they call a mixed ownership company. That's an interesting terminology for many of our audience here. Uh, this is about a mixture of uh, state-owned with private ownership together. Uh, and you were moving as a state-owned company uh, uh, executive to now a mixed ownership company executive. So when it comes to business confidence, I see from uh, Ambassador Ra's question, uh, there's indication about uh, how about private entrepreneurs? How are they being honored about their contributions? What is your understanding of the latest uh, uh, development. We know there are policies being reconfirmed recently. We also see a lot of uh, uh, discussions about that since China's uh, Central Economic Work Conference uh, the, uh, the end of last year. So, Mr. Jia. Well, there are some special things about Chinese companies. Um, Hisense Hi started out as a 100% state-owned company, but encouraged by the state, we reformed our ownership structure. 74% of our equity is now in private hands, only 26% in state hands. Now, 76%, that's mostly in the hands of certain strategic investors and our own workforce. So through market forces, corporate governance, and the operations of our shareholders' meeting. We operate on a much more of a market footing because we are in a very competitive sector, and that puts us on a much better footing. Now, we are in a good position to observe what's going on in the Chinese economy, particularly when it comes to private businesses. Last yeah. There were close to 300 regulations issued by various government bodies encouraging private business. Now, that has given us signals which enhance trust in the development prospects of private businesses. Now, for high sense, we operate on a fully corporate footing now, of course. So in sectors like ours, it's the same for us as for other private businesses. We operate under market forces. We try to achieve an edge through better technology and innovation and just managing ourselves better as a company. From that point of view, um, last year and the year before, there were difficulties mainly in the real estate 
sector and there was a bit of a crisis in monetary terms, but what we see is also a challenge with a lack of consumer confidence that has been turned around, is being turned around by the adoption of various macroeconomic control policies, and I think that that is going to rebuild consumer confidence. Yeah, last time I'm looked, I'm not uh, chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, but uh, uh, so... And later I'd like Dr. Jumi also <laughs> to respond to the same question, please. So uh, this is a responsibility of others, but a few reflections. One, to agree with Jin Ke-yu, the, um, in terms of the Chinese consumer and consumer confidence, uh, there are two things to do. One relates to wages policy, and the second relates uh, to taxation policy and, shall we say, social provision <coughs> under the terms of the Chinese budget. Why do Chinese uh, consumers save so much? Because they have much less generous social security <laughs> than the rest of us, from education to health uh, to retirement income, etc. You are largely on your own. And if you're concerned simultaneously about your future employability, you're going to save more, particularly for your kids. Mm. So dealing robustly with these two questions on, average, on the level of real wages, uh, which of course goes to the ultimate competitiveness of aspects of the Chinese export model. But if you're going to go to domestic consumption as a growth driver, this has to be uh, addressed. And secondly, social provision. On business confidence, the second point that I made before, uh, the truth is um, there's been a perception really in the last five years that in China you've seen the advance of the state-owned uh, state enterprise sector and the retreat of the private mm -hmm. sector. It's a uh, politically incorrect statement in China, but I'll make it anyway. Guo Jin Min Tui, advance of the state, retreat of the private sector. So this has actually uh, had an enormous uh, impact on perceptions in terms of uh, private sector business confidence. So therefore, um, the, the uh, need for the uh, Chinese government and the CCP to frankly de-emphasize ideology and to re-emphasize the core question of uh, the normal profit incentives for businesses operating within a market economy mm -hmm. is the fundamental question in terms of restoring business confidence. Finally, on trade, which you asked me to answer all three, so I'm being assiduous as a student of Confucius and taking the instruction from the teacher, that's you. Uh, and that is uh -huh. and, uh, <coughs> and that is, um, uh, this goes to the management of the US-China relationship. What the leaders did in uh, San Francisco uh, in November was decide to hit the pause button <coughs> on geopolitics. That's good. What we don't know is how long the pause button will remain pressed. Is this a tactical shift over the next 12 months? And then we'll revert to where we were in previous years, where geopolitics would undermine most elements of, uh, of economic confidence and trade normality. Yeah. Or will this become a longer-term uh, shift? I hope it's the latter, but that is the core question, the entree of both Joe Biden and Xi Jinping today. For 2024, it will be even more complicated as to who will answer that question, I guess. Uh, I want to go to... I want to go to Dr. Zhu Min to respond to also to the earlier interactions among your fellow panelists uh, briefly, because I also have some er er more questions for you as well, sir. Well, that should take uh, an hour. I least. know, I know, yeah. Well, on the cons consumption side, uh, Karen just list a few things, but if you're looking for the data, last year cons consumption increased 7.1%, mm -hmm. compared with 5.2% GDP growth, which is good. So that means consumption confidence is bad. The real issue is not the consumption growth, it's the overall Chinese consumption level is low compared to the GDP shares, which is a historical issue. So China needs to continue to work very hard to boost the share of consumption in the total GDP. Currently only roughly a little bit more than 50%, which is way low. So I think that's the issue, but there are many things you can do. The fiscal policy needs most money on safety nets, as Kevin mentioned, I think this is important. And also the wage increase is also important. Um, but many important issues, there's still 150 million people living in the city without what we call the city ID, <coughs> hooker issues. So speed up the reform on the uh, residential ID issue will boost the consumption in a big way. 
We expect to see another 150 million people moving the city in the next 20 years. So grants is a 300 million people consumer power, give them city ID, is very important. Good news is indeed the government speed up the whole thing. So I think a consumption issue, is the growth is strong, but the level relatively low, it will take a long time. Mm. The private sector confidence has also picked up. I see that they are doing good on something, on trade issues. China trade last year is a 0.2% growth, almost a zero, as I mentioned. But private sector uh, on trade issues is 6.3% growth. So private sector, the share in the total trade increases 3.1 percentage GDP, a percentage point. That's mean previously they only account the 50 percent. Now they account the 53.1 percent. So private sector response to the global environment change very fast. So I think that's a good. Uh, could you mention one thing? So whether the green transformation will be able to meet the growth need? I think this is indeed is an issue. It's a we, critical issue. Yeah, we, we saw the, the green sector grow strongly, EV, batteries, you know, it's all fantastic, right? But scale is a big issue. So in that sense, the government will continue to put an amount of money into the green infrastructure. So this year, we roughly estimate the Chinese authority will invest so 10 trillion RMB in the green infrastructures. Uh, digital energies, the digital facilities, the data sets, <coughs> and the uh, power system, digital power systems, uh, to f facilitate on uh, the, the green transformation, also to avoid uh, over-invest in road and the bridge. So mm. they will try, to, because 10 trillion RMB will provide very strong growth support for the whole economy. Following up on what you said, uh, uh, we love uh, the Chinese uh, economic policies which always come out as in PowerPoints. There's four new, as they say, uh, new technology, new infrastructure, new investment, and new consumption. That's the four new. Earlier, we also heard the PowerPoints coming from the Chinese Premier talking about the green development. There seems to be also a long list of uh, uh, possible new green initiatives. So how will these policies work with the question that all of you critically ask, whether it is enough to gear up the Chinese uh, economic growth. I want to ask also uh, the uh, business leaders here, uh, Mr. Jia, briefly. Jia Zong. Our time is limited, so I'd like to ask you, Mr. Jia, um, just in telegram style now. Well, a lot of what the Premier said was very important for high sense, um, in particular the new emphasis on high technology. And that's important for us when we want to better satisfy customer needs. Um, secondly, um, in structural terms, um, the, the emphasis on replacing low-end products is very important for us. Um, at high sense, we are also very keen on green manufacturing and green consumption. Um, greening the entire industry value chain. That's the focus of our efforts. Like our peers in China, we are trying to improve recycling and reuse of consumer appliances and reduce our own emissions. We hope that we will be able to share best practices with other companies around the world. What does that mean for your global supply chain and also your global manufacturing landscape? I hope you will say more about that. Just very briefly. Yes, just quickly, um, could you show your views on those? Well, there are similar issues for the global supply chain. ESG is a common language for the global sector now. We have responsibilities when it comes to green development, when it comes to climate change. And there's a lot of demand out there for green supply chains. We have 100,000 staff of whom 25,000 are outside China. They're employed by us outside China. Now, when it comes to R&D, design, and recycling and so on, we have to design and make deployments in green terms. That will give us better momentum for the future. So, um, something that has not been mentioned uh, perhaps uh, yet uh, in the context of restoring business confidence and, 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 and really 
uh, reassuring uh, international investment is that, you know, in my view, China is 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 getting closer and closer to to a developed market yeah. at this time for 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 healthcare for life science. So, something which is very critical uh, is. Uh, the uh, consistency and predictability of the regulatory environment. Uh, we, as a company, has been extremely active on portfolio management, and today one of the uh, uh, potential constraints and limitations that we encounter when, it, when we think of inorganic moves is uh, um, regulatory constraints related to uh, potential nas national security issues. I think this is something that has to be very uh, promptly addressed so we can be playing and operating globally. I think okay. the, the other one, and I need to mention this one because it's super important, is the intellectual property uh, protection and the reward to innovation in China. All right. We have very limited time, but our uh, uh, conference uh, war, uh, forum staff, they are so kind and generous in giving us some time in uh, ask questions. Why don't I collect uh, two questions? Two questions, okay? Two questions from the audience, and then we quickly ask our panelists to answer those questions. Let's collect the question first. I see one hand over there, the gentleman over there, and then we give another chance on this area, okay? So please, uh, very briefly, who very you brief are, and very the short. question. Uh, question is, when is China eliminating coal for energy consumption? Okay. And when is China um, stopping the very fast growth of carbon emissions? 29% three years ago. All right, we got your question. Now. Thank you so much. I don't Thank want you. to cut you short, but we are having limited time. Any question from this area, just to be fair? Okay. This gentleman over there. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I just wonder whether there is any plan for structural reform. What I mean by structural reform is that the privatization of SOEs and the state banks uh, to improve total factor productivity. Otherwise, I, I, I don't know whether, where, where this uh, you know, gross okay. impulse can be come from. Uh, real structural reform, when? Timeline, yeah? Okay. I'm so sorry, we have great questions coming from our audience. Much better questions than mine, but we have limited time. Let's just throw these two questions to our uh, panelists, whoever want to address it. I do mean Inka, you're good on this. Oh, oh, oh. okay, we should do that. Oh, <laughs> well, the first okay. question is about the coal, right? The yeah. transformation. So very briefly, two yeah. sentences. Coal three. account of 58 percent of Chinese energy consumption. You can think about it. The challenge is a daunting, right? Um, the good news is uh, renewable energy development so fast. Last year, the whole world installed 500 gigawatts renewable energy. China account 40 percent. Yeah. So the first time, the new capacity in China, over 50% of a new capacity now. Um, we will gradually uh, stop building the coal plant, I think, uh, in the next two to three years. And then start 2030, we'll start to retire the existing coal power plant. Yeah. Because existing power uh, plants still have more than 25 years life. So it's a gradual approach. But uh, the coal, obviously, is a big issue. You will see, because in China, the solar power cost is way lower than coal power right. cost now. So that means coal will be out. Thank you. About the real structural reform, uh, uh, as phrased by that gentleman, anyone want to respond to that? Well, the re structural reform I think the structural ongoing, reform, so. we've been talking about that throughout the session, but very briefly. Oh, it's all the policy today in China you have observed are structural reform. Okay, all right then. Let's have a final word <laughs> from everyone. Uh, one, or, one or two sentences from everyone as a very brief conclusion uh, for today's session. Uh, why don't we start from, uh, I would just go this, 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 and then over there, okay? So maybe Dr. Zhu Min, we change a little bit uh, the sequence. Well, One or two sentences only. Well, Chinese economy, I think, do have its own resilience, but the challenge is daunting. It's a long structural reform process. So it will take time, but you will get there. All right. Uh, Ambassador Rod? Consumer confidence slowly improving, business confidence remaining static. Um, stop talking about ideology. <laughs> 
Mr. Gardejo. Uh, accelerating growth will uh, require um, um, that we continue to operate on a, on a, a free trade environment. Uh, globalization isn't perfect, but it's the best we have. And, chi and I, co I don't conceive a, a, a global world without China. Jia Zong, Mr. Jia. So here, I well, I think globalization is the overall trend. It has seen some stumbling blocks later, but I think it is the trend for the future, and I'm confident. Last but not least, uh, uh, Professor Jin. In so, many, in so many ways, China is in transition, and all this requires a bit of patience, whether it's real estate or debt or carbon, um, and uh, that's how we should see it, I think. Mm. I am a humble student of the Chinese economy and also an extremely humble student of our panelists today. I think you mentioned some very important keywords: trust, confidence, and transformation. <coughs> really appreciate it for your efforts. And thank you so much also for everyone's uh, contribution. Thank you. This is a joint session between CGTN and World Economic Forum. I'm Tian Wei. Thanks for watching. Bye.